Welcome to Redefine the Circle, a podcast where we discuss all things pitching. I'm Ashley Sunshine, co-owner and head of pitching development at S2 Breakthrough. In this podcast, we're going to highlight topics that focus on how to maximize your pitchers now. We're going to discuss some of the trends that we've seen at S2 Breakthrough and talk about how we use data to create systems and training approaches that are specific to each pitcher. It's so important for us to continue to share this information and facilitate discussion within the pitching community so we can keep evolving as coaches and ultimately grow pitching into something it's never been before. Thanks so much for listening. And thanks for joining the quest to redefine the circle. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Redefine the Circle. I'm Ashley Sunshine, head of pitching development and co-owner at S2 Breakthrough. Today's episode... Series three, episode three, is all about continuing the discussion around velocity, the culture we've created around velocity in our game. Generally, I've talked about why I feel like it's a broken culture, why we should be prioritizing it, but why I think that we're prioritizing it in the right, in the, in the wrong way. And what can we be doing to sort of create a healthier culture around velocity? And then ultimately, make velocity something that is growing in our game, not just at this, you know, five to 10 pitchers in the country, but across the board. Something that we see as a whole, we're starting to see pitchers throw harder and harder at all levels. I think the way that we are going to get there is when we start deeply understanding what goes into velocity, what are the culture pieces that we need to start changing, how can we do a better job? So for us, when it comes to velocity, one of the things that I think is really a disconnect between what we know to be true about the thresholds or the demands as far as velocity is concerned at the college level, and then how we trickle those demands down into the youth level. So what I mean by this is, okay, we say, okay, it's really special for an athlete to throw 64 plus in college. I'm just sort of throwing that number out there. And so when I'm out on the recruiting trails, I want to see all the pitchers that are throwing 64 plus. And those are the athletes that I feel like fit my mold. What's interesting is that to me is that When we are only looking at just a number, we only want to see velocity. There's no doubt about it. The argument is not whether or not you want that pitcher to throw those velocities when she gets to college, when she's in college. But if we are only identifying just the number at the top and recruiting with that mindset, then in my mind, we can go wrong. And there's a couple examples of why I think we could go wrong. One, if we see a pitcher out in the high school level and she's currently throwing 65, but we really don't know what's underneath of that, meaning maybe she's really unstable as an athlete. So outside of the pitching motion, highly unstable athlete, what we would call level one here at S2 Breakthrough. She has very, very poor mobility, so she's poor at rotating. We don't know those things necessarily. And so what we know is when we have an athlete come in here for an assessment and they're a high velocity thrower, sort of this mid to upper 60 and beyond, of course, when they throw those velocities and they are in that range of movement, we put a red flag on them immediately, meaning odds of, of or increased risk of injury is written all over her assessment report. We cannot just simply fuel the fire, throw harder, throw harder, throw harder, when the base underneath of that is not appropriate, cannot sustain that. So what we are doing is when we're saying, okay, 65 plus is what we wanna see in college, we can't just simply take a number, not know anything underneath of that, and then go ahead and identify that that's the athlete who's gonna be able to do that once she gets here. Can she sustain it? What is the base underneath of that? So in addition to that, you know, we have athletes that I think are just underneath of that tier. So maybe they're throwing 60, 63 in the high school scene. However, when we're actually watching their trends and watching their training progression, what we're seeing is they're only going up, up, up. They're going up in velocity because they're going up in their stability generally, their trunk control, their stability, their ability to rotate well, their efficiency in their patterns. And so they're just consistently building. They are going to get to the college scene, maybe throwing 62, 63, which may at first glance seem sort of underneath of the threshold. But when you're following how they were able to get there from maybe 58s, 59s, to that next jump of 62, 63, when you can see that they are getting there through really good organic growth, meaning great mobility, 
really good stability of the trunk, proper patterns. This is the type of athlete that we absolutely want to capitalize on. By the time she then gets to college with a base of 62, 63, and a great base to build off of from a stability and rotation standpoint, now we're in business. And so I think that's really the mindset that we have at S2 Breakthrough. We have athletes that walk in here and there's no doubt about it. They're just, they have freaks when it, they're freaks when it comes to their ability to produce power. Power numbers outside of the pitching motion, off the charts, they are above average to elite numbers uh, when we're measuring power outside the motion. And what we know is like we just want to support them underneath as much as possible. We want to make sure that they're able to maintain that and stabilize that. There are athletes that already come and have that. That's very, very rare. The athletes that can throw incredibly hard in high school and have the appropriate base underneath of it are incredibly rare. So what we really spend the majority of our time at S2 Breakthrough is with the athletes that typically have a slightly above average profile, a power profile, and that we are just constantly watching that velocity trend go up as we are attacking the underneath piece. So the majority of time, again, I feel as if in the softball world, we are prioritizing the number and we'll do anything we can to get there. We will jump off the ground and sprint and throw. Uh, we will do all kinds of crazy drills. We'll lift whatever weight possible, as fast as possible, sprint. But the reality is none of that is going to continue to send us in the right direction unless the base is strong. Redefine the Circle is brought to you by Rapsodo Softball. Whether it's at the plate or in the circle, Rapsodo delivers all the data needed to enhance your player's development and to give us a platform to become more informed and better coaches. Rapsodo pitching is absolutely critical when it comes to maximizing your pitchers. In addition to measuring velocity, pitchers and coaches get a detailed look at all of the ball metrics that influence break. Spin rate, spin direction, gyro degree, spin efficiency. Together, these metrics tell a story about a pitcher's data profile. And to grow that profile and ultimately maximize what that pitcher can become, understanding the metrics is a must. Rapsodo not only provides high-level feedback in the moment, but also creates back-end reports so coaches and athletes can visualize and fully understand the entire story and how it's progressing. Rapsodo is such a powerful tool. Instant data, relevant metrics, innovative visuals, and don't forget the in-app slow-mo video that allows pitchers to watch their pitching patterns right alongside the ball flight metrics they yield. Bottom line, Rapsodo is a must-have in the world of player development. See the data, feel the results with Rapsodo's softball technology. Again, when I talk about the approach that we take with our athletes, it's to make sure that we're following those trends, we're prioritizing those trends, and that we are we know that when they get there, it's only the beginning. So I want to take our attention now uh, to my computer screen here where I'm pulling up just a little bit. I showed this in the past, I think in, in um, series one, where I'm just walking through our assessment process. But this is just a glance at an athlete's mobility and movement capacity. And what I mean by movement capacity is her trunk control. This is an athlete that when we saw her, she certainly was throwing already like low to mid 60s. She had an above average power profile, not elite power profile, but above average uh, to elite, sorry, above average power profile. Um, and when she came, she had not crazy, but some challenges with mobility. So as you can see here, she's got shoulder flexion, so not full length through the lat not able to really control the pelvis well, and then the inability to really segment the body, segment the trunk, to rotate at an advanced level. And so in training, so this is just a snapshot, it's about one year. Uh, this happens to be a remote athlete, so she's obviously not here daily, but it's here pretty frequently. Um, and so as we're tracking this, we know that we are helping her preserve her shoulder health, we are helping her preserve the quality in which she's able to rotate. And she's able to rotate more and more at sort of like a more advanced level. And we're just following those trends. We know in her training that that base of mobility is strong. Similarly, when we're looking at movement capacity, which is trunk control, we know that when she started, she had severe anterior core challenges. She broke down an anterior core quite a bit. And so her ability to absorb force effectively in jumps was really compromised. So this is an athlete that can throw anywhere from 61 to 65 miles per hour, and she has poor uh, breaks essentially, and cannot absorb force effectively. Red flag. So when we she came here, the conversation was not like, we can help you get to 69, 70 miles per hour. The conversation was, your velocity is tremendous. Your base underneath of it 
has to hurry up. It has to start catching up with where you are because you will not be able to sustain this in a healthy manner year after year, not just through the, the recruiting process. She came to us as a freshman in high school, not just through the recruiting process, but into your college career. We've got to get that base to catch up. So in my mind, I thought if she even stabilizes in her velocity for a while, we'd be great. But generally, that's not the way it works. When we are attacking stability, ability to rotate, unlocking mobility, when we are talking about that translating into efficiency of of patterns in the pitching motion, velo goes up. And that is really the main approach that we take here at S2 Breakthrough, making sure the base, the process of making sure the base is putting athletes at in the position to go up continuously in a healthy manner throughout their careers. That alone is the primary way in which we watch velocity trend upward. And I can't stress that enough. Are there ways in which we target it more aggressively? We actively target it more aggressively in strength and conditioning with like VBT and in uh, in the pitching bullpen or in training sessions with underload? Yes, and I will talk about that. What are the circumstances? What goes into those circumstances? But for now, the majority of athletes we have, this is the way that we are prioritizing velocity. And I just think this is such a critical conversation to have because until we understand what's underneath of velocity, we're gonna continue to put demands on pitchers who do not have the base to move in a healthy way in the pitching motion. And we are gonna tell them, 68 or bust. And that is a very, very dangerous demand to place on pitchers. So the conversation needs to grow. It needs to extend into what does velocity even mean? How can we ask our our pitchers to produce more power and ultimately rotational power? How can we make sure that all the energy in their body is getting out of the body into the arm and ultimately into the ball. That's efficiency because without that piece, then the arm is gonna try to do it all on its own and we're certainly at increased risk for injury. Okay, so this is this athlete's uh, her mobility and movement capacity. So we know now that she's a sophomore, we only see this going up. I can only imagine where she's gonna be after one year of training, now two years and three years before she even gets to college, what this looks like. Let me pop over into what her actual velocity trend looks like just from the summertime to now. So summertime into now, we can see, so again, she's a remote athlete, so you can see her her data is a little more sporadic early on while she was playing and in season. But look at this trend. She already was throwing about 60 up to 64 miles per hour at this time and look, not by making her essentially tap into underload, not by having her jump off the ground, do lunges and sprint. She's not doing VBT yet in strength and conditioning because she's not there yet. It's not appropriate for her yet. Watch the way her velocity is even going up. So she's multiple years post puberty. She already is throwing 60 to 64 miles per hour. And now we're up to this about 65, 66. So she is pretty regularly. That is only by making sure that we're building and prioritizing velocity in the right way with the right foundation. So this obviously is an example of an athlete who throws very hard. And so what I would argue is that what I want to make really clear about these discussions when it comes to velocity is that because we aren't, uh, you know, just constantly throwing velocity type of things out there that we're not just posting on social media, everyone's highest. It's because we take a much broader view when it comes to velo. We understand what it means for an athlete to be able to continue to grow. And with that, what I would say is we need to start understanding that this 65 plus in college, the majority of athletes, their ability to get there Likely, when you are looking at them when they are 15, 16, 17 years old, they are likely sitting in this 60 to 63 range in the moment. But to know more about that story, what are their trends? What is their training? How do they move? How stable are they? What is their general ability to produce power? These are the questions we need to start asking. No more should we really be just relying on our eyes to determine if someone has an upside. And no more should we really be just determining whether or not a pitcher can compete at the college level when she's 15 years old. We have to start uh, identifying the types of data that we can really use to see an athlete years before she gets to the college stage to really start to predict whether or not we think what her growth can actually get her to by the time she's a freshman and then obviously toward the end of her career. 
Hopefully this discussion is helpful. Again, a short and sweet in today's episode, just to start to lay out, again, the, t- the ways in which we really think about velocity, how we are really attacking it here at S2 Breakthrough, making sure that mobility, movement capacity is first and foremost, and then obviously as intensity increases, really making sure that that, in- that, that movement quality translates into the pitching motion. This is, in my mind, the healthiest way for us to be building velo, not just chasing a number for the sake of chasing a number, but having a much deeper understanding of how can we grow in the short term and how do we ultimately grow in the long term. Thanks so much for watching today. I hope you enjoyed. Looking forward to next week's discussion where I dive just a little bit deeper into what does it look like when we actively attack velocity just a little bit more specifically? When we go one step beyond this sort of organic growth model, what are the details? What are the things that go into that? What do we factor in when deciding if an athlete is ready for that? She needs to do that. And then what are the things that we're really cautious about? So stay tuned for that discussion next week. As always, thanks so much for joining this week. And continue to quest on to redefine the circle. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for listening to today's episode. I'd love to connect and hear your feedback. You can contact me directly at ashley at s2breakthrough.com. If you're listening, you can leave us a review. Or if you're watching, go ahead and leave a comment below. Also, be sure to follow S2 Breakthrough on all of our social media channels and subscribe to Stream S2 to find all things player development. Until next time, quest on. Quest on.